in the process of benchmarking NVLink for multi-GPU, it would seem that a beef has spawned on Twitter, one between myself, Paul, and now even Jay. So if you've been following along, we are going to be responding to Paul's attempted overclock, wherein he tied our score, and Jay's actual number one overclock for two GPUs in Time Spy Extreme right now. So Paul, the wannabe gonna-be clock drop and undervolt and prankster will soon be beaten in Time Spy Extreme, and Jay will follow. And Jay, I got 99 problems, but a chip ain't one. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and the Silent Base 601. The Silent Base 601 is one of the quietest cases we've tested recently, laying claim to the crown of silence on our charts, and still manages reasonable airflow by shipping with a pair of high-quality fans. The 601 also uses well-designed panels and unique ease of installation features to streamline builds, includes well-placed dust filtration, and is large enough as a box to fit a full ATX build. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, so for this video, though, what we are actually doing is benchmarking NVLink, and the goal is to see how do 22080 Ti's do versus 21080 Ti's versus a single 2080 Ti. It's been a while since we've looked at multi-GPU scaling. It's never been that good. Typically, actually, 100% of the time, the uh, conclusion from us has been, don't bother. But it's interesting. NVLink, this is a 100 gigabyte per second bridge for the TI or 50 gigabytes per second for the 2080. So that gives us a lot of options. And in this testing, we will also be revisiting the PCIe 3.0 bandwidth limitation question to see if we're finally exceeding that bus. So uh, first of all, for the stream, for the stream discussion, you probably saw the slider in the lower thirds thing earlier, but we are going to be doing a Rip J or a Rip Paul or some kind of combined stream. Following up our Rip LTT stream, we'll be doing that on Wednesday, uh, the, the week coming up, Wednesday, starting at roughly 7 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S., and that will be live on our YouTube channel. So the goal for that is going to be testing our hybrid card that we built. Hopefully it's actually good. I don't know. <laughs> with uh, probably go with NVLink and see how it does with two cards, see, see where we place on the Time Spy Extreme scores. Stuff like that be a lot of fun. Make sure you tune in for that. For today, though, what we are testing has already been laid out. We are using OneNote and EVGA card for the card in the first slot and the FE card heavily modified here in the second slot. So that's important to note. Uh, the scores will be slightly higher by nature of higher clocks than a single card, but we're talking single digit percentages here, like three on average, uh, versus a just straight FE card. And then we're doing that in NVLink. So uh, other than that, I guess let's get into it. Ashes of the Singularity is an incredibly interesting benchmarking tool for this scenario. Ashes it uses explicit multi-GPU via the PCIe bus to allow multiple GPUs of varying make a unique feature of DX12 to work with one another. This also means that it communicates entirely along the PCIe bus. The cards can't lean on the 100 gigabyte per second bandwidth provided to them by NVLink or the bandwidth provided by typical SLI setup. Instead, all that data transacts over the significantly more limited bandwidth of PCIe, which is limited to 16 gigabytes per second in X16 mode and is already doing work. In our Titan V testing, and we'll pop that old chart up on the screen, we found that the PCIe bandwidth limits were finally being strained. Again, this is with no supporting bridge, and it's the only title we know of that really makes use of multi-GPU in this scenario. For the 2080 Ti's, we removed the NVLink bridge and just tested them via explicit multi-GPU through the PCIe bus. This is to determine at what point we hit the PCIe 3.0 limitations with no assistance from outside bridges, with PCIe 4.0 looming, there's been a lot of talk of end of life for 3.0, or at least the end of its usable life in high-end enthusiast systems. In Ashes, we found our maximum performance as 127.2 FPS average, averaged across 10 runs, running in by 16 and by 8 mode, which would be common in Z370 platforms, we had a measurable and consistent loss that exited margin of error. The loss was about 1.7%. Not a big deal. Running in by 8 by 8, 
We saw a massive performance penalty, unexpected actually. The cards were now limited to 107 FPS average, resulting in a 16% loss, and we measured this a couple of times just for parity. Time Spy Extreme is an extremely useful synthetic tool for this type of benchmark as well, and also runs memory pretty hard for the GPUs. We ran Time Spy Extreme five times each on these cards, automated, and found a difference of 0.19% between by 8 by 8 and by 16 by 16 for graphics test 1, which is geometrically intensive. This is way within margin of test variance for a 3D mark and produces zero loss of performance between the dual by 8 and the dual by 16 modes. Part of this is likely because of NVLink's additional bandwidth, reducing reliance on the PCIe bus. For Firestrike Ultra, we observed an FPS difference of about 1%. It was a 0.9% difference in Graphics 1 and a 1.0% difference in Graphics 2. We ended up running these an additional 5 times for a total of 10 each and found the results repeated. Firestrike has variants run to run, so we cannot with full confidence state that a difference exists. But if one does exist here, it amounts to about a 1% advantage in the dual by 16 mode versus dual by 8. So other than Ashes, where we run into a PCIe bus limitation, we know that the NVLink bridge and even SLI is enough for a by 16 and by 8 configuration to work well without any meaningful bottlenecking. And that's why we're moving back to the 8086K bench to look at comparative numbers versus our previous benchmark results so that we can compare the NVLink version of the 2080Ti's versus the single version of the 2080Ti's versus some other cards. First up is Sniper Elite 4. Sniper Elite 4 produced some of the best scaling results, as it often does. This game is also the best DirectX 12 implementation that we're aware of, so its scaling will not apply to all games universally. It is an outlier, but a good one that can teach us a lot. With our usual benchmark settings, the dual NVLink cards push past 200 FPS with 4K high and hit an average of 210 FPS under non-overclocked settings. This outperforms the stock RTX 2080 Ti FE by about 94%. This is nearly perfect 2x scaling and has been rare to achieve in the past years. But it's always exciting when we see it because this is what multi-GPU should be like and almost never is. Versus the overclocked single 2080 Ti, we saw a performance gain of 71% with the stock 2080 Ti's in NVLink. Not bad, and overclocking the two cards, although annoying to find stability, would regain that lead. The GTX 1080 Ti's in SLI did about 170 FPS. The next major consideration is frame time consistency. Multi-GPU has traditionally shown terrible frame-to-frame -frame interval consistency, often resulting in things like micro-stutter or intolerable tearing. For this pairing, as you can see in our frame-time plot, the lows scale pretty well. It's not a near-perfect 2x scaling like the average was, but it's pretty close. As a reminder, these plots are to be read as lowest is best, but more consistent is more important than just being a low interval. 16 milliseconds would be about the 60 FPS line just for perspective. It's a very impressive performance in this game, which is more a testament to Sniper Elite 4's development team than anything else. They've continued to build some of the best optimized games in the space. We also tested with Sniper Elite 4 at ultra settings, just in case there was a CPU bottleneck. Here's a quick chart with those results, but they're not too different in terms of scaling. Far Cry 5 and the Dunia engine are up next. These also show some SLI or NVLink scaling support, and at 4K high, Far Cry 5 plots the RTX 2080 Ti single card at 74 FPS average for stock, or 83 overclocked. Lows stick around 55 to 60 FPS in each value. With dual cards, we managed 108 FPS average, posting a growth of 46% over the single 2080 Ti stock card 74 FPS average. That's not nearly as exciting as the past result, but at least it's still some scaling. At 50% scaling though, you can't help but feel like you're only getting $600 of value out of your additional $1,200 purchase. For the lows, we're looking at a 0.1% of 60 FPS compared to a 0.1% of 55 FPS on the stock 2080 Ti, so no improvement there. Let's look at a more valuable frame time plot as these 0.1% metrics don't tell the whole story. In our frame time chart, we can see the limitations of scaling. Although the NVLink cards run a higher average, they fail to sustain similar scaling and frame time consistency. Frame times are spikier and potentially more jarring, although raw frame rate alone makes up for much of this lost frame-to-frame -frame interval consistency. 
Back to the main chart, we also have the 1080 Ti cards and SLI to consider. In this configuration, the SLI 1080 Ti's operate at 91.4 FPS average, with spurious lows bouncing around between 42 and 66 with 0.1% metric, although it averages high. For averages, the overall performance uplift amounts to about 60%, over a single 1080 Ti SC2 and outperforms a single 2080 Ti FE card. Of course, there will be games where SLI gets you nothing, but instances like this will permit outperforming new hardware at the same price with old hardware. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is next. This is a new game and will eventually host RTX features, in theory, but didn't at the time of filming. The game also uses a modified crystal engine. It's got a lot of issues with NVLink and SLI, and NVIDIA is aware of them. As of now, we have experienced blue screens of death upon launch, upon minimizing it, upon enabling TAA. We've experienced crashes upon minimizing, and seemingly other random crashes. Fortunately, we were able to eventually figure out how to work around these issues for just long enough to run a benchmark. Just know that the game is extremely unstable with multi-GPU. One of the other issues we discovered was constant blue screens with, again, TAA enabled, which is unfortunately what we've been using for our full GPU reviews. So for this reason, we retested the 1080 Ti with TAA off as well, just for a baseline. We did not retest all devices, only those which are marked. At 4K, Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows a few FPS difference between the 1080 Ti SC2 with TAA on and off. This shows that there's minimal overall performance impact, but it will offset our data a bit. The 2080 Ti FE single card averaged 67 FPS originally, with lows tightly timed around 56 to 58. This means frame times are very consistent with a single card. Multi-GPU got us 147 FPS average, and the dual 1080 Ti's got 113 FPS average. These two numbers are directly relatable as they were run under fully identical conditions. For SLI, it becomes even more difficult to justify the 2080 Ti's versus the 1080 Ti's, not that we fully endorse SLI as a good overall option anyway. F1 2018 also showed scaling in its results. NVLink's 2080 Ti's managed 168 FPS average here with 1% lows at around 69 FPS. The RTX 2080 Ti single card had an average of 99 with its 1% lows at 47 when stock. The result is scaling of about 70%, pretty damn good. It's not as impressive as Sniper, but still a better gain overall than expected for SLI configurations over the past few years. As for the 1080 Ti's in SLI, we measured them at 88 FPS average and 57 for the lows. A single 1080 Ti SC2 ran at 81 FPS, giving us a dismal scaling of 9%. Hellblade is up next, just for a DX11 Unreal Engine title. This game has some of the best graphics in a game right now, making it a good benchmarking option, and represents Unreal Engine 4 well. It also did not show any scaling. In fact, technically, we observed negative scaling with this title, which is not all too uncommon with SLI. We saw a drop of about 16% in performance, with additional jarring and tearing during gameplay. Doing research for this content, we learned that there is a custom Hellblade SLI profile out there made by a modder, but it's not an NVIDIA official profile. Out of the box, it appears that NVLink does not work with Hellblade, but it also looks like some modding could be used to hack it to work. GTA 5 is last. This is another DX11 title, but it uses the Rage engine and has been more heavily tuned for graphics hardware over its three-year tenure. It also shows some scaling and averages, though not necessarily in low-end frame time performance. We posted a 132 FPS average with the NVLink cards, as opposed to a 77 FPS average with a single FE GPU. The difference is an approximate 71% improvement in average frame rate, but lockstep frame time performance. There is no improvement in low end performance overall, and for dual GTX 1080 Ti cards and SLI, we managed 117 FPS average for a gain of 83% over a single 1080 Ti SC2, allowing it to outperform a 2080 Ti when overclocked albeit with similar frame time consistency illustrated in the lows. We are nearing CPU limitations in this game, with hard limits around 170 FPS average for our configuration. There's your results for NVLink. This was the most popularly requested content in our recent live stream where we overclocked a single card, the XC Ultra. It was Super Chats nonstop asking, when will you test NVLink? Well, there it is. So, I don't know. I, to give you my genuine opinion on this, with SLI, uh, at our outlet, we have routinely found that it's never been worth it in the past. Because the risk of things like blue screens, as we saw in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, sure it'll be fixed, but do you want a game to come out and not be able to play it for a month? 
or play it with one card and wonder if it'll ever be resolved. Uh, if you have that kind of patience, cool, but you might be dealing with that a lot. So that's always been one of our concerns with SLI. Uh, and then other games, just with poor scaling, like anything below really 60, 70%, doesn't feel too good when you're spending two times the amount of money on cards and you're getting really something more like 50% more performance, not 100% more performance. So that never feels great. Uh, but then again, if you're trying to hit, we had someone on the stream the other night asking, what do I need to hit 240 hertz frequently or regularly or all the time? I mean, this would pretty much do it. And to be completely fair to NVIDIA, since the last time we looked at SLI, it looks like support overall for the modern games has expanded significantly. So there are actually a lot of games out now that do support SLI. And this is SLI, even though it's called NVLink, as it behaves, it is SLI, just with a different bridge that has more bandwidth. So it's getting more difficult to come to a conclusion on whether or not you should actually consider multi-GPU. Uh, we only tested a few games here. It is not indicative of everything. If you, Doom, for example, for the longest time, probably, to some degree, even now, really didn't scale at all. It wasn't supported. I haven't checked in the last couple months. If it's changed, cool. But a lot of the time, these games, they just don't get support. Uh, there's negative scaling in a lot of games. It, it takes a long time to get support in a lot of games. So that's always been the concern with multi-GPU. It does look better today than in the past. We'll say that much. But is it worth it? <laughs> I we would still generally make the recommendation to go with single GPU because you're less likely to run into those issues that are extremely frustrating when you have not just a $700 card, but now a $1,200 card that will be doing nothing except for blocking airflow because they're all three slots now if SLI or NVLink isn't supported in a particular game. So that's the concern. Now, it does perform better overall. The games we tested do show it in a better light generally. Uh, although a couple of them were 30, 40% scaling, we saw Hell or uh, Hellblade was negative scaling. One of the games had a 9% uplift for the 1080 Ti's and SLI F1, I think that was. So it's a mixed bag. Whether or not you want to do it, I mean, we gave you some data, but really you need a lot more than we have here. You need like every game to get a full picture of it. And that's not even the problem. The problem is what do the new games do? How long do they take to get support? So our general recommendation is still single card. But if you do, do already have like a 1080 Ti and you grab a second one for cheap enough, maybe used or something, it might be worth considering as opposed to, for example, a 2080 Ti because you can spend half the money and get pretty similar performance or even more just only some of the time. That's the big question with multi-GPU. Anyway, I hope you like the content. As always, subscribe for more. Check out our live stream one more time. It'll be on Wednesday coming up. Uh, Wednesday after this goes live, coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you subscribe to catch that. Go to twitter.com slash gamersnexus to get updates on it if anything changes, or to follow along in the rap battle that Paul and I have invested our souls into. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick one of our products, like the shirt I have on, not literally that one, or the mod mats. Patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.